So I've seen episode one of The Wheel of Time on the IMAX screen, on a projector screen, inside the Tower of London, on a computer, and now twice on my own home theater. I've had some time to pick it apart, and I have some thoughts. There are some tough criticisms and some amazing things I want to talk about. Join me today as I will be giving my full spoiler review and reactions to episode one of The Wheel of Time. Alright, so before getting into the breakdown, let's get some business out of the way. First of all, this video is sponsored by WattCon. If you aren't aware, there is a new Wheel of Time based convention coming out in July of 2022 here in Columbus, Ohio. This was put together by over 30 fans and other creators, and it is a Wheel of Time focused fan convention that is geared towards both readers of the books and fans of the new TV show. It's going to have a super different feel from other conventions you may have been to. We're aiming to make it a pretty damn good time. This year, we have special guests of honor, Daniel Green, who many of you know from YouTube and as an author, and Kate and Michael Redding, who are voice narrators of the Wheel of Time audiobooks and really legends in the community. We will also have another very special guest, which I am not allowed to announce yet, but I'm sure all of you will be very excited to meet this person. Now, tickets are now on sale, and we are getting closer and closer to filling up. So make sure to book your ticket and the hotel block today. We have two levels of tickets, but the great thing is both of them come with meals included in the ticket price. So mark off July 8th through the 10th, 2022 on your calendars and come have a blast with 500 of your best friends at WattCon here in Columbus, Ohio. You can get tickets by heading to www.wattcon.com and click registration. You can also find frequently asked questions and see the other various creators that are involved as well. Last thing on the business end, I am going to be changing up my spoiler rating system now that we have a show. You're going to see red, yellow, and green still, but instead of just giving the book level of spoilers, I'm also going to be giving episode levels as well. That way it's going to help those who don't want to be spoiled. So this episode will carry a spoiler rating of red with major spoilers through episode one of the TV show and only through Eye of the World, the first book of the series. Normally, I will try and keep these reviews book spoiler free, but in this case, I think it's necessary to talk about some changes. So let's open with some general thoughts, and then I'll transition to what I liked and what I didn't, and then I'll give my final rating for the episode. Now, these are just going to be my general thoughts. I will have a more detailed scene-by-scene -scene breakdown that will come out later. So overall, this is a solid start to the series. But this is going to cause quite a bit of controversy with book readers who have not been following the development of this show. There are absolutely changes from the books. Some of them are seemingly very major. And they come up in this episode. And I think for somebody that did not know those were coming and had the expectation that this was going to be an adaptation directly from the page, that was probably a big shock. I'm going to do my best here to explain some of the changes, why I think they were made, and then I'll tell you which, which ones I agree with and which ones I don't, because there are certainly some I do not agree with, and I don't like them. That all being said, at the end of the day, changes were always going to be a part of an adaptation. They always were. Whether it was the looks of the actors or actresses, to the backstories of some of the characters, when you're adapting the written word, the challenge that you have is you have to show the audience things rather than tell them like you do in a book. We don't get to read their inner monologue. We don't get to see their motivations. So they have to create scenes to show us motivations, and those scenes do not always exist in the books. So things need to be added and removed to make the characters actually more true to the books. So in a way, changes are needed to simply make the TV show the same as the book, which seems super counterintuitive, but it's something that needs done a lot. So having talked to the people behind this is they set out to make a story that was true to the characters and true to the heart of the books while needing to change some of the plot points. Some of the things that we think are major plot changes really aren't and they're there just to make the characters that we know and love and the reasons that we fell in love with this series make them more realistic. They want book fans to love this series, but primarily they need non-book fans to love it. So keep that in mind. We're going to come back to that at the end of the video. So let's hit some things that I loved from the first episode first. The first thing that I noticed was the lack of exposition. There was some, as it is needed to set up the story, like the opening sequence there with Moraine, but they leaned away from direct exposition and more into showing us things and letting us learn as we go. I personally love that approach. But it comes with a warning for those of you that are watching this. When shows lean too far into the show-not-tell approach, the explanations tend to be spread out across the story. So what I mean by that is things are going to go unexplained for a while, and you might think that they're leaving it out or not addressing it, or I can't believe they didn't talk about that, but only to have it explained later. Shows like Westworld do this all the time. 
There are certainly questions that I had leaving this episode, but I will need to wait for future episodes to really tell if they just ignored it or if they're saving it for a payoff later. That's one of the things that comes when you do that in a story. Another thing I absolutely loved was the performances. I thought the main cast was outstanding. I specifically love Madeline Madden's performance as Egwene, as well as Marcus Rutherford as Perrin, and in a super bittersweet way, Barney Harris was absolutely amazing as Matt Cawthon. He was so good, and without getting into future episodes, he gets better, and knowing that he isn't going to be around next season makes me sad, because he really is great. Another standout for the short time that we see him in the episode is Johan Myers as Padon Fane. His smile and the way he carries himself are perfect. I loved every second he was on the screen. I want more of him. So let's talk about a change that I actually liked. Uh, one of the biggest changes has been controversial to many people, and those were the changes to Matt's backstory, primarily his family life. Rather than being a respected member of Emmons Field, Abel Cawthon is a drunk uh, and somebody who cheats on his wife in front of the whole village. His family is poor, and Matt gambles and even steals at some point to provide for his sisters. Now, I can see how those changes would upset some people, uh, but I think this is one change that I am 100% on board with, and let me explain. Matt is a chronically underdeveloped character in the first two books of the series. His motivations are never really fleshed out. We're told he's a scoundrel, he wants to seek out treasure, but we don't know why he's that way. He's very flat, and he's pretty annoying, actually, in the first couple books. He's not even a really great comic relief. Seriously, tell me someone who loved Matt from the first time they met him in the books, just books one and two. He really doesn't do anything but be annoying. It isn't until later that he comes into his own. And I think these changes are actually an improvement on his backstory from the books, and they give him a real motivation and conflict that the later parts of the story will be able to explore. And to address his family, I know a lot of people think they did Abel Cawthon dirty here. This actually gives Abel Cawthon a chance for a story arc as well, especially if they do a specific storyline that comes later in the books where he will become more prominent. I'm gonna save the spoilers there. There's going to be a redemption arc possibility there as well. Abel Coffin in the books was never really anything more than Tamal Thor Light. So this is a welcome change. I don't think it's the end of the world that they changed his character. I actually think there's a chance to end up liking him more if he can break out of what he is. Another thing I really liked in this episode was the battle itself. It was far more brutal than the books, with at least what we got to see on screen. And it leaves us feeling like the Trollocs are legitimate monsters, and the villagers are fighting and seeing them for the very first time. I, I love the choreography, by the way, between Lan and Moraine, and how he protects her as, as they fight. They were really in sync, and you can actually see, even though they didn't really explain the water bond that well, you can see it there, like they're in sync with each other. I like how the camera also goes all shaky cam at the beginning of the fight, because we're, as the audience, just as confused and stunned as the residents of the Two Rivers are. Another scene in this battle I loved was Day's Conger leading a group of women with pitchforks to take down a trolley. I actually love Day's so far in the show. That moment was just badass, old blood women, stubborn Two Rivers, and I loved it. I love how she's like, come get it. Now she's probably still drunk, but I loved it. So let's move on to some things I for sure did not love. And there are a few things in this first episode. I'll start with the very beginning. I did not like the opening sequence at all. In concept, I love the Red Aja being set up as baddies who are gentling men on the spot, something that they are not supposed to be doing, but it was just underwhelming to me. I wanted that opening shot to capture new viewers, and I don't think it did that. I really wanted to see a man that can channel actually be dangerous, show him fight back, show him channel. Have a big sequence there at the beginning where then they gentle him. That would have hooked non-readers far better in my opinion. I did like Leandrin. I like how she was played for sure. I was just not a fan of that scene being the opener. Another issue, and it's a small one in my opinion, I was not a fan of Moraine saying there's rumors of Four Tavirin, but not for the reasons you might think. I, I didn't want them to make Egwene Tavirin, but I, I, as I think it takes away from what she does and what she earns on her own, but it isn't confirmed that she is yet. It was just said that she, it was a rumor. My issue actually isn't with that. It's more with the fact that how in the world are there rumors of this? Why would you have not been there before, Moraine, if you heard rumors of Fort Tavirin? Are they that common? 
I just thought it was very clunky dialogue to throw in a, a, a shot for fans there to say the word Taviran that nobody else would know what means at that point. I just wasn't a fan of that. And there was some other clunky dialogue that I also was not a fan of. The Moraine entrance scene in the Winespring Inn felt weird to me as it was exactly the same as the teaser and we pointed out a couple holes in that as well. I was not a fan of Bran Alvear's dialogue with Egwene and they seemed to keep him out of the limelight a little bit in the show. I wonder if they weren't happy with the performance. Uh, that would actually be prime for a recast, in my opinion. He just didn't have the Bran Alvear vibe to him. And if they're going to keep him in later seasons, I wouldn't be opposed to a recast there or maybe just a reimagining of how they portray him. But his dialogue with Egwene was super clunky and weird and felt off. Now, these are small things to me as the, di the dialogue in Game of Thrones pilot episode was super clunky as well. Go back and watch the breakfast scene in Winterfell where the Lannisters are eating breakfast and tell me that that is not some really awful dialogue coming from a great actor in Peter Dinklage. But two primary points of criticism that I've seen and that I actually agree with are about changes to Perrin's character and his relationships and then the pacing of the episode. So let's address Perrin first. Perrin has a wife named Layla and he accidentally kills her during the Trolloc attack with an ax. This is a major change on multiple levels as Perrin is married and additionally, he fridges his wife. Now, if you are not familiar, that is a trope that happens in television and movies where a female character is brutalized or killed to advance a male character's plotline. It happens often and it's used as a motivator for the male character, always at the expense of that female character though. This wouldn't be a thing if it didn't happen all the time. For a show that many white cloaks out there consider to be super woke, this is a decidedly unwoke change and one I'm not super on board with. But let's address why they did it. There are a couple reasons why it happened and they do make sense. It doesn't change the fact that it's fridging, but it makes sense. One, they are setting up and building up the animal within Perrin. You'll notice that when it happened, he was in a berserker rage to a degree. He didn't mean to do it. He just got carried away with himself, lost track of where he was. You could almost hear the sound disappear and then boom, killed her. This is a great way of showing what we know his inner monologue is in the books. He's always worried about letting the wolf take over, letting himself go berserker, letting himself run loose. And so he holds himself back. And that's a driving piece of his arc as a, as a character throughout the stories. Secondly though, they are also setting up his overprotective nature that we're gonna see in his later relationships. You may even see it come up later in this season. Now again, it's not that the change didn't make sense. It actually does make sense and it will work well within the story, honestly. It's just a change that I think could have been made differently in my opinion. Brandon Sanderson threw this out there. It, uh, you know, it could have been rather than his wife, it could have been Master Luhan that he did that to. I think that would have worked I do understand a little bit about why they went this route because it does have a different emotional impact, but still it's fridging. Now there's another quirk here as well. Though. There is serious speculation that Layla may, may indeed have a different past. I'll just say that without getting into spoilers. We'll address that in another video, but that may serve to make this a little bit less of a fridging. And so we will have to wait and see and watch later episodes. This may be one of those times where they're giving us a little bit at a time and you just have to trust that it'll work out. Now, the last piece of criticism has been the biggest piece of criticism I've seen of the first episode from most people, and that is the pacing. It simultaneously feels too slow and then feels way too fast at times. It's all over the place and the ending of the episode felt incredibly rushed. Rushed to the point that it doesn't really seem plausible to the group that they would just up and leave with Moraine. We built Matt up to be protective of his sisters, and then he leaves them alone on a dime. It just did not feel like they had time to do proper setup to force the characters to have to leave. And yes, this particular example with Matt will be addressed later in another episode. So to a degree, it's one of those things where again, wait and see, but it doesn't change the way it feels in this episode. I would have loved to have seen another two minutes, at least just added to the show, to have them being told to leave by Tam and their parents and assured that it would be okay. Or even more rationale as to why it's them that, that the Shadow Spawn are after in the first place. Cause that's sort of loosely established. They sort of go after them, but not really after them. So how do we know it's just those four other than Moraine saying it? That was something that I felt like was missing a little bit. But with all of this, therein lies the problem. I'm very critical of the pace, but the pace is actually the biggest problem with Eye of the World, the book in the first place. If you ask most readers what the weakest part of the Wheel of Time story are, they will tell you the very beginning 
and the late middle parts of the book or the slug. There were only two ways they could go. They could expand the two river scenes, which were sort of boring already, and in doing so, they could add more scenes and they'd have to manufacture more tension somehow, because that is where people get lost. Most of the time I hand the book to somebody, they don't get past those first five or six chapters because nothing happens. They can't do that with a full episode of a TV show where nothing happens. So they would have to do something to manufacture some tension, to create the character development, something like that. Or they could do what they did and just try to get out of the two rivers as fast as they can so they can start the real story where stuff is happening. Given that they were only given eight episodes for this, they chose the second option and the pacing absolutely suffers because of it. My hope is, is that they can address some of the missing elements and justifications for why they left or some of the things there in later episodes, maybe with flashbacks or different conversations, things like that. Now, although I certainly had criticisms, I did like the episode overall. And the pilot episodes are notoriously difficult to get right because... You have to lay out the foundations for the rest of the season and introduce people to the story, especially with such a huge world like this one. And in terms of those standards, I would say the episode succeeded in what it was out to do. It was action-packed, and most non-readers I talked to wanted to keep watching after seeing it. I do understand most of the changes, but I also knew a lot of them were coming. If you're someone who was immediately put off by all the changes, or you felt blindsided by them, this has been something that most of us who've been following the development of the show knew was coming for a while. So I would say to you, give it time and look at this as another turning of the wheel. It isn't going to be exactly like the books, but it never was. It wouldn't matter who was adapting it. It never would be. But at its heart, I still feel like it is the wheel of time. The characters are the characters. The plot of the story is still headed in the same direction. They just started from a different place. I think you'll find the later episodes without getting into spoilers feel a little bit more like the story that you know, and this is mainly the setup. So that's why I'd say it's a little harsher here. So for a rating, I would give this episode a 6.5 out of 10. And I know that sounds harsh to most of you, but I think it had problems. They weren't killer problems. And also, fortunately, the episodes after this are far, far better, in my opinion. This episode succeeded in laying the groundwork, and it did the heavy lifting, so those other episodes could shine. So keep watching and enjoy it. Let me know what you thought of episode one in the comments of the video. Make sure to like this video and subscribe to the channel to be updated when I release other reviews and lore content around the Wheel of Time. Make sure to also check out my live blog for my trip to London to see the world premiere of the Wheel of Time. You will get to see the interviews with the cast and the directors and some awesome stuff in London. Check out the Patreon if you want to support the channel. Thank you all for watching. Go get registered for WatCon. And until next time, peace out.